Hi guys, so uh, glad to be back here again. Uh, I think I'm back here like once a year for um, like over the last three years. So I think this is my fourth talk also. I can't remember, but around there. Um, yeah, every time I, I'm here, I try to like talk about something different, something, you know, sometimes it's like circuit boards, custom circuit boards, um, quick hacks. Um, today, what I'm going to talk about is like uh, something I did in uh, back when my company has a uh, hackathon, right? And I was new at the company, so I can't really like do much software related, related changes. You know, so what? Um, what I basically did was I built some kind of like a hardware device, right? Um, and it basically runs off an of Odroid XU4. Some of you may have heard it, heard of it before. Yeah, it's basically a very really powerful um, ARM-based yeah SBC. Yeah. So um, why why did I do that, right? Um, I was basically at the hackathon and I, I work at Roblox, right? It's a 3D games platform and they basically run on like iOS and Android. And uh, I really want to play the games using um, the Nintendo Switch controllers, right? And of course, the Switch controllers only work on the Switch, which my company's game does not run on. So, yeah, I just YOLO and decided to hack it together. I didn't know if I can do it in like about uh, eight days or so, but I just went ahead anyway. Uh, have most of the parts on hand. Um, and, you know, like moving forward, it's like I was hoping that in future I could actually build my own phone, but that's uh, a lot more work and learning to do. So, uh, yeah, um, for those who don't know me before, um, yeah, I basically eat, sleep, code, uh, build stuff in China, manufacturing up to small volume runs of less than 1,000 units. Um, I advise a couple of startups in Singapore, like uh, Experts, Tripcar, um, etc. I currently work, work at Roblox, and you can look at my um, portfolio on my website. Oops. Yeah, so prerequisites is that, you know, I have to build this thing really quickly um, in slightly less than a week. Um, we need powerful 3D rendering capabilities and we cannot use NVIDIA tech, right? Everyone thinks that, oh, 3D game, you must run it on NVIDIA platforms, right? But no, many most 3D games like uh, Ro uh, Roblox, Fortnite, PUBG, anyone plays like PUBG or Fortnite over here? No? <laughs> okay, that's surprising. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, these games can actually run on a phone, right? But they were not really made to run on like the Tegra platform. Um, so I, I basically decided um, to take a look at this. It definitely cannot run on Raspberry Pi 3. It's cheaper, but it's not really that powerful. And I really want to use like the Nintendo controllers on it. So the ideal architecture looks something like this, right? Um, the important point is that the Joy-Cons actually communicate over two channels, Bluetooth and SPI. When you dock them into the Switch, it communicates over SPI because it's faster, it's, wire, it's a wired connection, operating at one megabit per second. But, um, you know, like this is a quick hack. So essentially, I simply just use the Bluetooth module and connect them to the Joy-Cons directly. Um, and also use um, off-the-shelf, many off-the-shelf components. Over here, the key components are really um, the Odroid XU4, which is at the top right-hand corner. Um, the LCD that's from the same manufacturer because we want to have like good compatibility with it. And I don't really have time. I really want everything to work out of the box, right? The, um, the flex HDMI and USB cables are really important. You can see that um, they usually come with like default HDMI cables, but they are too fat, right? So I had to get like special um, flex connectors um, and off-the-shelf DC con um, voltage regulators and lithium-ion battery pack. Yeah. Um, so I basically did a integration test. Firstly, I put all the components on the table, just wire them together, um, install uh, stock Android and see that it plays YouTube. So that's great. Um, I also installed my company's game, right, to do some performance testing. I have no idea. This was the first run and I'm glad that the 3D performance is great. It runs at like 30 FPS at least on a 1280 by 700 pixels. Yeah. So uh, that's good. This is just like on the table testing. Um, and so the next thing I have to do was because like um, 3D printing, the casing is, takes, is really time consuming. It takes like 48 hours at least, right? So I, I really had to put all the um, measure all the components, cut out what I really want, what I have in mind, right? Um, I carried out the front, the back. So it's basically two pieces, the like clamshell design, um, simple four screws to uh, screw the entire design together. Right, and there are many other uh, cutouts. In internally, I actually measured every single uh, component to ensure that theoretically it fits. In theory, <laughs> in theory it should fit. Um, and there's some vents because the uh, CPU is really hot. So, and this is actually a fan, so I had to have some like vents on the top. Yeah. So um, after like 36 hours, um, the the print was successful. I get I got these back. 
they were okay. I mean, the print quality isn't great, you know, but it's great for like a, a hack, right? And I tested that the LCD fit in it. Um, yeah, the LCD has touch screen, so it's really great that the, uh, how would I say, everything like came together really nicely. Um, and also I added speakers. The sound comes through the HDMI, which comes out through the LCD panel. There are some connectors for speakers, so I just hot glued them together. You know, this, it's quite messy, but yeah. It's done at night, 3 a.m., couldn't sleep. Um, fortunately, the large components, like the power brick, they, they fit. That's not a problem. The main issue is that the, some things cannot fit, right? Um, did I miss some slides? Sorry, I have to roll back a bit. Oh, never mind. Uh, yeah, there, there, one, there were some, some issues, like the flex HDMI ca uh, cables were actually like slightly taller than expected. So they were kind of tight, uh, it's a tight fit and I had to reroute it slightly. The case couldn't properly close. You know, in theory, you, you simulate that it's fine, but in practice, yeah, you miss out some things. The LCD, even though I allocated quite a fair a bit of current to it, but it, it resets itself, like whenever the speakers are, if I turn them on too loud, yeah. Yeah, so like the flex HDMI connector is at the top. Uh, it's a bit hard to see, um, yeah, but they, they stick out like on the left side. Um, the, I, had, I had to actually insulate the rear of the Odroid because you know, it could possibly potentially touch the LCD and the other cables and stuff that was running behind it. <laughs> yeah, um, this shows how tightly packed, you know, the projector is really dark, but it's really tight. You know, I couldn't open it like, like a 15 degrees before the cables are, are like limiting its angle of opening. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I also got the Joy-Con connectors from eBay, they're like spare. So it's like this little um, piece of metal which allows you to slide the Joy-Con in. I basically got them. I did not use the, the contacts, but I screwed them onto the case so I could just slide the Joy-Con onto it. Yeah. Um, software. So I was simply using Lineage OS 15.1. It's uh, Oreo. Only this version supports size like, 3D acceleration for the particular uh, GPU on a board. Um, I had to upgrade to Alpha 0 0.7 or else Bluetooth wouldn't work. EMMC was faster, but the problem was that, I, I don't know why, but Lineage OS, when I tried to upgrade, uh, it basically failed to boot. So whatever, right? I don't have time. I just swap over to the SD card and move, move forward. Um, it's very good that Lineage OS came with all these, no, Odroid, the Odroid fork of Lineage, Lineage OS came with all these like uh, simple um, switches, right, on the, in software. So I could switch various things like GPS, Bluetooth, um, yeah, without having to like go into the command, uh, the console. Yeah, and the final product looks like this. <clears throat> yeah, so everything came together um, pretty nicely, at least from visually. Yeah, I took some uh, videos of um, you know my other teammate playing with it. So basically, the whole idea is that it's very similar to a switch, but it's not a switch because you know we don't want to bother with like uh, going like actually like porting it over to a switch. At least not it wasn't my intention. Yeah, so I was very happy with the 3D performance. <clears throat> yeah, so you could actually take the same platform. You could play Fortnite. You could play. Uh, PUBG on it as well. Yep, and you also could take out the controllers and play it similar to a Switch. But that was the original intention. Mm, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, for future work, um, obviously there were some deficiencies, though we did not implement the SPI communication, so it was purely over Bluetooth, it was slightly slower. You can actually feel the latency compared to actually using a keyboard and mouse. Um, the off-the-shelf LiPo pack is like kind of big, right? So what we really want is to actually have a, uh, a integrated battery power management system, which you know, like handles the charging, feeds back the power to Android, you know, and show the power bar. Right, and obviously shrink the case, it was kind of large. Yeah, and that's all over here. Any questions? Yeah. How much did it cost? Um, I mean, in, in terms of parts, most of them were off the shelf. It probably, the electricals are less than 500. Yeah.
the screen, the screen I will call like 75, the, the board itself was like 65 USD, yeah. But most of it, I mean, it's, it's just modules. If you really go into customizing like custom circuit boards and things like this, then obviously the price will increase, but I didn't have time, yeah. How hard was it to get the Joy-Cons to um, You have to have custom code. So basically, Joy-Cons are recognized as HID devices. So online, there are a couple of tutorials that say, oh, you can use it as HID device. But the problem is that Android natively only supports one at a time, right? But in software, if you write your own software, you could recognize two Bluetooth controllers. You could grab the mappings of all the buttons. Yeah, so custom code is involved. Um, if you're going to communicate over SPI, there's even more custom code. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you need a kernel driver, but low level stuff. Yeah, and yeah, that concludes my segment. <laughs>